Welcome to the Period Besties podcast with Stasha and Katie. Think about it is chatting with your best friends about all the TMI stuff you've never talked about before with two period coaches who've been helping hormones collectively for over 20 years now. I'm Stasha. And I'm Katie. And we're pulling back the curtain on what it's like in the world of menstrual coaching. From puberty to menopause and everything in between, we're here to show you how period coaching can save the day. We'll share practical tips and information you can put to immediate use to improve your hormones and happiness. We're removing the mystery, ending the taboo, and shining a light on just how powerful period coaching can be. So whether you need period coaching or are considering becoming a period coach yourself, these episodes are going to help you. We'll share stories, coach live on air, and bring smart, savvy guests to share their wisdom too. Let's start today's episode. Oh my God. We just finished the recording with Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein. And I got to tell you, you are in for an adventure in this podcast episode. I had the most fun. Yeah. They are, I love that they're besties. And we were talking to besties as our period besties and just like the conversations and where we went. I definitely think I overshared a lot about my own personal life, but Ricky Lake asked me, so I had to share. That's right. She's a talk show host. She knows how to ask those questions. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I'll tell you everything. <laughs> that was fantastic. I loved the chats about the uh, business of being born, uh, the landscape of birthing since that m- movie came out 15 years ago, the conversation into birth control and the business of birth control movie, and oh my goodness. I feel like we didn't even get to about half the questions we had because we just, it was such a good conversation and it was so important. And uh, I'm really stoked to present this episode to all of you who are listening right now. Go listen. uh, Let us know what you think and definitely share this one. This is definitely something that is so informative and awesome and fun and enjoy. Nasha here to let you know that we were so excited chatting with Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein that we just sort of started chatting. (laughs) So you're about to hear our interview with them and it's going to start off with some hellos and highs, but then there's going to be a real crazy rough cut because we were just talking about like where we've moved to since Katie and I have both moved since we saw Ricky last in Los Angeles and So we're just kind of catching up on where we're living now and stuff that no one really cares about. Uh, So we just cut it right to where we started to dive in. And then you're going to hear us talk about, oh, we should be recording right now because that's how just silly off track we got there for a moment. So enjoy this episode. Sorry about the rough cut, but thank you for your understanding. Hello. Hello. Hi, Katie. Hi, Stasha. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi. Zoom user. I had twins during COVID. <laughs> April 2020. Yeah. Identical boys. It was that is, That's not a COVID birth. That is like the height of... Oh, were, yeah. Were you able to have your partner in? You? No. No, I was by myself. You should do a documentary. By the way, you guys should start recording. Start recording, right? We are recording. Oh, yeah. We are. Okay, okay, yeah. good. That is horrific. Wait. Yeah. Do you have other children besides, had you had, no, it's your no. birth experience. You were alone. I would imagine they gave you a C-section. Yes. I had a C-section, um, told two days before my husband wasn't allowed to stay. It felt very like 1950s, but also prison and all of the things like biggest nightmare in my life. I was always like, you know, it's just like horrible, right? Can't you move. Had ma- you had a mask on. I, I would imagine. I did when during the C-section, and then I refused to wear it after because I'm like, no, I can't breathe. I'm by myself. I can- can't move. Like, if you don't want to come in, that's fine. Like, I I'm not wearing this mask. <laughs> I can't even. And so you wait, and you had your babies in L.A. Yeah, at Cedars. At Cedars. Oh my God! Can I ask who is your doctor? Doc. Oh my God! What was my doctor's name? Doctor Rosen. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, but Aaron Rosen, his dad is actually like one of the founders of like IVF. Like he, his dad is like, I can't, I can't remember his dad's name, but he 
owns the clinic that does like the Kardashians, like all of the famous people. He's kind of the the fertility guy. I guess I don't know, but yeah, it was it was wild. Alabama, you guys, can you believe? Don't get me started. I I can because I can, but it's absolutely horrifying. Yeah, no, it's there's no word. I don't even understand what that means. Like, what does that mean now? Nobody knows. And then all these people that want to be parents are now like, probably we're about to do transfers and now are like devastated at home. And now they have no access. It's horrifying. Yeah, that's why they stopped everything because no one knows what it means. So (laughs) they just just like stop doing anything because we don't know what we can do now. So... No, well, until they invent like a mechanical uterus, I mean, how can you rule that? No, I was there was a great someone on Twitter wrote something like, "You can freeze an embryo, you can't freeze a baby." There's the difference. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the yeah. Thing. Ben and Jerry's came out and said that today too. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh my god. You know, it's yeah. it's so wild. Is that your next documentary? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, in our spare time. No. Documentaries are no. don't get us started. We have a project. We've been trying to do this project. We've been working on it for like a year and we've been pitching it to this beautiful deck, amazing team of people. And they keep slamming the door in the face and saying no. You know, they don't they don't want to do something that's actually good for the world. <laughs> It's like a follow up kind of to the business of being born, but like, you know, where we are now. And yeah, super fun. I mean, it's so needed though. I mean, and when you guys get the green light, um, definitely talking about COVID and that experience, like, there's so many things that we need to learn from. Wow. And your babies are doing great now. They're, yeah, they're fine. One of them was in the NICU. And the ironic thing was, and we can, move on from this in a second. Um, my husband was allowed to go to the NICU to see the baby, but wasn't allowed to come see me with the other baby in the same hospital. Why? What was their reasoning? Risk of infection, risk of what? I'm not surprised. There was no like reasoning. They were just like, you can't stay, but there was no explanation, nothing. It was like, but he can go to the NICU. I was like, but you can't go to the NICU at the same time. So I couldn't go to the NICU when he was in the NICU. Oh, my God. I can't imagine how traumatizing that must have been for you. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm definitely in therapy. Just to talk it out because you need to, like, get it out of your cells. <laughs> that were the- you able to bond well with you? And I don't know if you breastfed or not, but was that interrupted? Um. A little bit. And then it just got too hard. I had ended up just like pumping. Yeah. Because it was like, I don't know, it was really hard to do both at once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like recover. I don't know if either one of you had a C-section, but that recovery is like no joke. She did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And like a twin one apparently is like worse. So. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Like the whole, I'm just glad I didn't watch it. They're like, do you want to watch? I'm like, I don't think I can watch that, but thank you. <laughs> Well, so that they gave you a choice. Yeah, right? <laughs> wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. You can play your own music. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Music. <laughs> so fucked up. Yeah. It definitely was. But it's one of those things where you meet other COVID moms and everybody has like similar stories. So at least it wasn't like just me, right? So being able to like share and talk about that has been healing as well. Yep, 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 yeah. yep. Mm. Um, shall we get this party started? Ah. <laughs> Do we have a hard out? Um, let's see. I have, a, I, I have, I have a little over an hour. So okay. like 10, I've got to be 10 to one. I, does that work for you, Abby? We've, yeah. So- I had booked us like two thirty to three thirty, and that, yeah, that's fine. Perfect. So uh, we, let's see, seeing as we're probably just going to slap this whole thing in and just let the whole thing roll. Cause why wouldn't we? <laughs> Never know I should say happen. welcome and thank you and everyone for listening and joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to have you both here. I got to sponsor the LA premiere of the business of birth control. 
And um, it was just such an amazing experience being in that theater and having all of that excitement and energy. And it was just like such a um, kind of soul fulfilling space where you know like of course that movie makes you crazy and enraged and also like you know you see the light at the end of the tunnel and some good stuff coming out so you go on a whole roller coaster of emotions but being in that community was an incredible experience with everybody so I'm just so thrilled that we got to do that and then have you guys here today uh, we wanted to share with our audience you know (sighs) How do you get started doing this kind of stuff? How do you get into these like women's spaces? You know, we are part of a community that is trying to end taboos, trying to get education out there, trying to get the misinformation off the block and put the real education out there. And here you two are doing it on a really big scale. And A, thank you. We need you desperately doing that work because it won't get into everybody's eyes and ears if we aren't all doing it. Right. Um, and so thank you very much for doing that. And then thank you very much for being here today and extending that process so we can bring it to some more people and another new audience, hopefully, and get more eyeballs on both of those movies. Cause they are very women centric. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to just kick off and say, you know, who are you? What do you do? Cause it's what we ask everyone. <laughs> Okay, I'll go first. Well, first, let me thank you for supporting us. And, you know, that that was a really special evening. And we could not have done it literally without you and and sponsors like you to to get on board with this work. Um, I'm, should I go first? I'm Ricky Lake. I, I, and this is video. Are you guys going to have video? They'll be able to see me, right? Or is this just sound? Well, they'll have the podcast option, but they'll also have the YouTube option. Okay. So let me just explain. I'm a little rosier than normal. I had a laser treatment yesterday. I didn't know it was going to be this invasive. And so, hence, I, I have a I have an extra red glow today. But uh, who am I? Who am I? I'm, I'm a, a former talk show host. I'm a documentary filmmaker with my partner. The best partnership ever with Abby Epstein. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. Um, I'm a really happy human these days. Like my life is in such a state of contentment and flow and joy and play. Um, and I, I just, I, I, I love the career I've had and I, I love like where I am now where I'm like, you know, really basking in this, my fifties with this amazing guy I found during COVID. You were having babies during COVID. I found like the greatest love uh, during at, in the heyday of like the worst pandemic, and uh, yeah, I'm just um, I'm really happy to talk to you guys about this work that we do, and I'll throw it to my bestie Abby. Mm. Hi, I'm Abby Epstein. Um, I was trained as a theater director, which is how I met Ricky. I was directing her off Broadway in the Vagina Monologues, which is a show I worked on for many years in many languages. Um, she directed literally hundreds of actresses and only befriended me. That is true. I always had a rule of like, I don't go out for drinks with the actresses. I don't want to be best friends. Like this is a job. And then Ricky came in and I was like, oh my God, she's my new best friend. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then I branched out into starting to do documentary film. I did my first film about the vagina monologues, the V-Day movement. Um, It was called V-Day Until the Violence Stops and aired on Lifetime. And then um, teamed up with Ricky to do my second documentary, The Business of Being Born, um, which was all very organic and the way it came together. And then we did... um, for follow-up documentaries together, more business of being born, kind of breaking down, getting deeper into all these topics around birth. Then we kind of jumped out of our niche a little bit. We did a documentary called Weed the People, um, which was about children with cancer using medical cannabis. And um, I think, you know, was actually a really powerful, powerful, like moving project. And overall, I think we, you know, just really looking at, you know, what is a plant medicine and what is a drug and what have we kept from people? What other kinds of like really healing, powerful plants have we kept? 
um, away from people because of, you know, greed and racism and other things. So that was a really powerful project, um, which was on Netflix for a while. And then we did the business of birth control together, which was inspired by um, Holly Griggspall's book called Sweetening the Pill. And Holly had sent us a galley of the book, like before it was published and thought, you know, that this might be in our wheelhouse. And she was trying to get a documentary off the ground. So I read the book on the plane from New York to LA, got to Ricky's house in LA. And I just kind of walked in her kitchen and I was like, I think this is like our next project. I mean, this is really scary and we're going to get annihilated for talking about this. (laughs) But like, I don't know who's going to say this if we're not going to say this. And and really, it was because I think when I read the book on the plane, you know, so much of it resonated with me. And I started to connect the dots of my, you know, journey on the pill from whatever, 19 to 30. Like, all of a sudden, I started to realize what I had not realized, you know, during the experience and even for 10 years after. So it was just, you know, I I think that that and that movie for us, you know, again, it was a very difficult movie to make. Um, It wasn't that difficult to finance, which is interesting. Um, We did a big Kickstarter and people were just like, yes, 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 yes. Like, I want to see this movie. But it was very difficult to like get made. Um, And then we ended up premiering it um, at Doc NYC and some other festivals, but we didn't get like a sale for it or distribution. So we've been doing kind of like periodic free screenings where we put the movie up for free and then we have it for rent on Amazon and on our website. Interestingly enough, we did sell the film in other countries. So we've sold it in like Spain, Switzerland, you know, Germany, like we have a European sales team and there just doesn't seem to be the same kind of like pharma controlled environment and stigma over there. And yeah, so that's, that's who we are, I guess, what we do. So interesting that in other countries, right? It, goes into a lot of other things that they do in America, like the food and other countries and it's not allowed. So it's really interesting that you were able to sell the movie rights there. It, it makes sense to me based on what's going on here. Yeah. And even, and broadcast too, like in Spain, we sold um, broad TV broadcast and like digital distribution. And I think, and same with Switzerland and, you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's it's super hard, I think, just to talk about. It's still like really difficult to talk about, you know, in any way. And I think that that's, you know, I'm part of like, I, it was funny last night, I was at an event, completely different event, not women related, not birth related. It was like a breath work, like sound journey evening, um, you know, with Jonathan, Ricky. Yeah, with Jonathan Stone. Yeah, Jonathan Stone. And, but anyway, but this woman was wearing this most gorgeous, like, kind of like, it was kind of like a vulva. It was like a black vulva with like a gold clitoris and a little gold. And I was just like, oh oh my God, your necklace. And she was like, oh, my friend makes these. And we started talking about the necklace. Turns out she's like a menstrual educator, activist. And we just like, (laughs) yeah, we just, of course she is. Like, we just got into it and... She was saying how she was just hired at like a huge public high school around here in Brooklyn to like take over their sex ed and how like crazy it is because she was saying even the other teachers at the school who are supposed to be teaching health were literally telling her like, we don't, we don't know how to teach the menstrual. Like, we don't even know what to teach. Like, we don't even You know, and I was talking to her about how just these women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, like don't even understand how their period works. Um, I actually started watching on the plane last week that documentary, The New One Periodical. Mm. So, yeah, it's kind of um, there are some people from Business of Birth Control who are in it as well. 
Yeah. Is it called unperiodical? Periodical. Periodical. Okay. Periodical. It was just released like a month ago. So I don't know. It was on the American Airlines. Like it probably is on some streaming platform that I could Google in a minute. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting because I felt like it was nice watching it because I was like, oh my God, you know, something finally, like there's something right. But that's also what they were saying a bit in the documentary is they were showing, you know, going into high schools and like who here has their period and the girls would raise their hands, who here understands actually what their period is. It's like nobody. Mm. You know, so that was, I think, what an interesting thing, like making the business of birth control is that there's no way to separate the body literacy piece from the birth control piece. It is like one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. A lot of the students that come into my school do it because they want to educate their communities and the schools around them are not doing it. They're not, they're failing. It's not complete, whatever it is. And a lot of the, a lot of the students come in potentially with a business idea, but also very much driven to educate their own communities and their own uh, areas and of uh, families, that kind of thing, because there's such little education out there. So I'm very unsurprised. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to find out where it is. No, and like so many of clients that come to us as well, you know, it's educating them and lots of aha moments. Like nobody ever told me this. Like my mom never told me. And I was like, yeah, my mom didn't either. I don't think she knew either. You know, it's like really trying to bring this awareness so that the new generation, like my best friend has two daughters and when they got their periods, they both called me, you know, they wanted to know everything, walk them through and they openly talk about it. Like, we were at a restaurant and they were like talking about it. And I was like, I would have never talked to my mom's best friend in an open restaurant where everyone could hear me. I would have been so embarrassed. And they like, didn't. Amazing. And, That's yeah. Incredible. I thought it was incredible. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. So what, was there any kind of personal reason that you guys dove into these very menstrual cycle woman cycle focused business like documentaries or did it was it just like this needs to be talked about you mean well with the first film the business of being born I mean I I was just so moved by my experience like and it was and it was a combination of like the timing of it so I had my children a long time ago my sons are 26 and 22 and so when I had my second son who was my home birth water birth that you see in the movie um, it was, he was born two months before September 11th and I was living downtown in New York. So it was like the combination of having this experience, this like the most empowering moment of my life, giving birth to my child in my apartment with my midwife and my doulas and just, just the different, the antithesis of what I had in the hospital setting and the timing of that being two months, two months later, I was holding my newborn watching 9-11 happen before my eyes, you know, from my apartment. So it was like, I think those, those experiences happening so close together in that sacred space, that's what prompted me to want to do something beyond my talk show at that time. Like I wanted, I thought I was going to die that day. And I was like, if I live through this, literally, I mean, it was that, that is like not hyperbole. I really thought I was going to die. It's like, if I live through this, where can I make a difference? Where can I like Mm. be impactful more than this show? And that's what led to Abby and I partnering and, and, and making this movie. So it really was like a calling. Um, I never really thought of myself as someone that could do this kind of work. Like I, you know, I'm a talk show. I was, you know, John Waters, you know, muse for a few years. I didn't ever see myself as someone who's going to take on something that is controversial and, you know, just, just very polarizing. And, you know, I just, I felt like I had to do it. And both of us, you know, when we made the movie, we really didn't know if anybody was going to give a shit. Like, honestly, it was like, you know, yeah. So it just, it, it's been this incredibly, fulfilling work, but also to see it have this life so many years later. I mean, it has, is it as important and as relevant today as it was when it came out in 2008. And that has been super surprising and, and also sad that like actually the birth landscape world is actually worse than it was back then. Hard to believe. How did okay. it feel to like step into that? I'm so curious, like, you know, 
going from talk show host to being more controversial? Like, how did it feel to step into that? Oh, I was up for it. Like, I honestly, and I was, we were naive too. Like, both of us had no idea that we were going to be like poking a tiger, you know? I'm, I'm America's sweetheart. Like, everyone loves me. I honestly was like, we, we presented the film. I mean, we, we made the film. It came out, it was premiering at Tribeca Film Festival in 2007. And we went and brought it to, to screen at Grand Rounds at the hospital where both of us had given birth to our first children at St. Luke's Roosevelt, which doesn't exist anymore. And we had the doctor, Jacques Moritz, who is Abby's doctor. We were on a panel. We thought, you know, I don't know. We, I, I certainly didn't think we would be attacked by the medical establishment. We were attacked. We were screamed at. We were called Nazi propagandist filmmakers, like by the by the the, the head of o, the OB. You know, ran around. I mean, it was so crazy. So like, it was then that we were just like shocked at like, oh my gosh, we have this little movie that we financed ourselves and made all by ourselves is is threatening to these to these people and and that was when it was like okay but but you know we went for it we just went and went on this journey and and there's been a complete about face you know this movie is like really revered and and it's still like the seminal film that people watch when they're having a baby and it, but you know i think na- naivety is like bliss you know ignorance is bliss and uh you know i don't know if we could have done it if we knew what we were getting ourselves into you know, we were attacked by the AMA and by ACOG. I mean, they personally attacked me. Um, but, you know, it's like flattering because, you know, like, like, wow, we really have like caused some a stir, you know. So you had to know going into the business of birth control that the shit was going to hit the fan. <laughs> yeah, so we actually had. So, OK, so let me just let me just tell you that I was on the, So my talk show. We did a lot of work back in the 90s. Uh, on teenage pregnancy and Mm -hmm. preventing teenage pregnancy. So I partnered with a group called the National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy out of DC. I was on their board, their, you know, their, their advisory board. I would go to that. We would have board meetings every year. I did PSAs for them. I was very involved with that group. And when they got wind from a, from a one paragraph synopsis of what I was working on, our new project, they dumped me off the board without even asking like that just like we cannot be in you know at all connected to anyone that's challenging the you know big pharma in this way anyway yeah so we definitely knew that we were going to be we didn't know that we wouldn't be able to sell the film domestically i mean that it's a beautiful film it's a fucking well-made brilliant film that is so important particularly with roe v wade and what happened there i mean it just like the timing it felt so like like meant to be, you know, that this has happened. And, and yeah, so it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a, been a real journey. But it's interesting that you, um, this was one thing that I think I thought was different about the two films. Like, yeah, we knew like in some ways the birth control would be like more, we'd get more like feminist backlash. We knew that. Right. But what was interesting is when we were doing media for business of birth control, you know, I felt like if I went on a news program, nine out of 10 times, there would be a female anchor on that show who would just be like, yes, oh my God, I hated that thing. And I was on this pill and it made me terrible and I felt suicidal. And like, so they were almost like not challenging the way that they would challenge us when Ricky or I would go on to talk about like home birth and they would sort of have to like push back. It was so interesting because they were like, you know, really eager to talk about this and really agreed with it. And then there's, there'd always be like some rando, like male anchor on the side who'd be like, well, I just have to say that, you know, our, our team medical doctor watched this movie and just, you know, disagreed with everything in it you know they would always have to have some sort of like you know but that I thought was kind of cool I was like all right so like women are definitely already have discovered this like you know women are ready for this message and want to know like what are the alternatives um and it was really just more like the medical establishment that was is not ready you know to 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 open this this gate 
but you know, then again, with the birth stuff, it sort of felt like it was both. It was like, you know, it's, it's very hard because like, again, anything like where you can be manipulated by fear, whether that's fear of pregnancy or fear of your baby dying or what, you know, whatever else the, the medical establishment is going to throw at you. Um, that's incredibly hard, you know, to advocate around and like trust your body in that way. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think that at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we, we both kind of feel like there is this, you know, rigged game going on where information is being withheld, information is being suppressed. I would say even like false information, right? Like how many stories have we now heard of somebody going into their doctor in their teens, in their twenties saying, uh, you know, I don't want to be on this pill anymore. I've just, I've gained a lot of weight or it's, it's made me gain weight. Oh, the pill doesn't make you gain weight. Like literally that is what they hear. Nope. Sorry. There's no study, you know, or I feel really depressed or that, well, it's not from your pill, you know, because it, it's infuriating. It's infuriating. Like the thousands and thousands of thousands of times we hear the same gaslighting like the same story over and over again. And I think the problem is it's just like, you know, they want to hold like, well, there's studies and then there's anecdotal evidence, you know? And so this is anecdotal evidence is meaningless, but we don't have studies. So all we have is anecdotal evidence. So how are we supposed to talk about this? You know, and if nine out of my 10 friends have experienced the same thing, then it's probably fucking real, you know, like what are the chances? So it's all kind of, it's interesting, you know, and even like I had, um, there was a progressive paper that I think they wanted to really, really attack the movie, um, Mother Jones. And I oh, had no. like, yeah, yeah, they really wanted to attack the movie. They were going at this whole angle about sort of like, woke progressive feminists getting sort of like um caught up in serving the conservative right by criticizing birth control you know that unknowingly there's this kind of alt right agenda which that may be i don't know why elon musk is tweeting or xing about birth control i don't know it is very surprising like there may be some alt right controversy doxing going on but like that's not who ricky and i are like we're obviously we're like two jewish girls from new york like we're not trying to feed the christian <laughs> conservative you know like that's not us but it was interesting so mother jones they were like going for this angle right but then i talked to her i had this intense interview with the senior journalist for like an hour and she had already kind of thrown us under the bus on a couple podcasts but I really, really, really spoke to her. And I, I think she, she got it. And she kind of like pulled us from the st story. She never wrote the story. And I remember one of the points in the film is she was like, well, uh, you know, the thing you say about the pheromones, I mean, come on, why would you put that in the movie? I mean, I looked and I said, well, wait a minute. Have you read Sarah Hill's book? Have you read This Is Your Brain on Birth Control? Because she, she really goes through the studies about, you know, how your pheromones are are put online or offline, you know, we're affected by these drugs. And she was like, I looked at the studies. One of the studies had 132 women in it or something. And one of them had 12, you know, she was just like, this is junk science, kind of like, why would you put that in the movie if you didn't want to, you know, be criticized? And I was just like, I just literally looked at her, I was like, it happened to me. It happened to me. Okay. So I know it's real. And it happened to so many of my friends that they were either with somebody went on hormonal birth control and was no longer attracted to the same person or, you know, the reverse, right? They were with somebody went off birth control and then suddenly realized they weren't attracted to that person because they had met on birth control. And she just kind of like, I just shut her down because I just had no other evidence except to say like, 
this happened to me. And then she was like, oh, okay. So, you know, but she did pull back. Like, I think she ultimately like didn't run the story because, you know, she saw that I didn't have some kind of like weird, like Catholic agenda or something that I was serving. But, you know, that that's one of the biggest problems with talking about this, right, is the, is the political piece of it. And I will say that when Ricky and I were making the film, we did run into that. So we ran into practitioners or advocates that we thought were secular or did a good job at pretending that they were secular and they were just about like education and, you know, understanding your options. But really, they were not. They were really being funded by um, that, that, that uh, organizations. That play, uh, that, that, uh, with, um, well, let's not, DC. let's not, what? Yeah. Okay. Let's not name it. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, let's not, let's edit that. Out. No. <laughs> we know who they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was interesting because they, they would try to like, take some of the stories of the film of like the girls, there were a couple of girls who died using the Nuva ring, for example, um, from a pulmonary embolism, which is a documented side effect. I mean, this is documented fact. This is like not controversial, but you know, they tried to use those stories with a different twist, you know, as far as like, because they don't believe in any contraception, <laughs> natural or not. So that is a problem you you run into. And I know Holly ran into that problem too with Sweetening the Pill with her book. And the movie and the book, everybody has to take a hard look at themselves too and their choices that they made, right? So people that you talk to that might have met their partner when they were on birth control, yeah. it's hard to hear that. Like it's hard to hear the choices that you need. Yeah. Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, you know, and like, and somebody texted me something the other day. Oh, it was Aggie, our friend Aggie, the biohacker. She was on a podcast with, with Dave Asprey. Must have been Dave's podcast. I don't know if it was Aggie's podcast or Dave's podcast, but like, like, I think it was Anna Colbert, our producer sent me the clip and she was like, is this true? But it was basically Dave Asprey saying that all these women being infertile, right? So like all these women be, being on birth control, which is basically sending a cue to men that were not fertile, was like actually affecting men and affecting men's own libidos and men's own pheromones because it's like they're not able to like have you know the same kind of signaling when a woman is taking a drug that it's it's shutting down her endocrine system and it was just like an inter you know I'm sure it's a very controversial little bite from that but I mean you know my producer our producer sent it to me like is this true and I was like I don't know it definitely sounds right <laughs> I don't know but you know so you could take it really far you could be like oh well look at the divorce rate and look at like why are men like this? And, you know, people point to this um, experiment with the strippers, right? That all these strippers got bigger tips when they were ovulating because- and not on control and not on synthetic. Not on, exactly. Yeah. Well, you don't ovulate, right? When you're on the pill. So like, it was just, int yeah, exactly. And like, so it was just, I don't know. I mean, there are silly little experiments, but also kind of like when you sort of take a step back, right? And look at, just mating in general and that we are animals and we do smell each other and we are, you know, it, anyway, but I was like, yeah, I think Dave Asprey's right. I don't know. I mean, it was just like an interesting way to, kind of, or maybe he's part of this alt-right conspiracy. I don't know, but it's like, you know, I mean, there's just like, it's hard because I think Sarah Hill's book was so pivotal and I was so happy that her book came out like, right when we were finishing the movie and we we're able to get an interview with her because her book is really as scientific as you can get with the science that we have. Wow. <laughs> it is. It's huge. It's such a big topic and it's, there's so little nuance in our world anymore. It's so very black and white. It's like, I'm not saying 
birth control is the devil. I'm simply saying there's other options. And yet that's like a firestorm of a comment. You know, you say something as simple as like, well, there's more than one option out there. And then it's like all hell breaks loose. No, it is. And I think even with the options you have, like I have a friend who is, you know, like my age and we were talking the other day and she wanted to change her IUD. She's using an IUD for menopause. Okay. So she's using the IUD to get the progesterone instead of taking it orally. That is her choice. She finds it convenient. Okay. Whatever. All the power to her. It works for her. Great. She literally, you know, can't find anybody who will like change her IUD with any kind of a pain relief, you know, and she passed out from the last time she had it done. And there was, you know, a lot of articles have been written about this, right? About women's pain and ignoring women's pain. So then it's like, you can't win either way. Right. Because even if you want to go get an IUD, then you have to have this excruciating, painful insertion and nobody's offering any kind of like, I I couldn't believe it. I was like, come on, there has to be someone in New York. She goes, no. She goes, there was one person who said they would knock me out to put it in and wanted to charge her $7,000 for anesthesia. And like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so this, like, it's just, it feels like, you know, everything it's like, you're so dismissed. It's like, if you get pregnant, you're screwed. Cause there's no abortion. But if you want to use birth control, you're screwed. Cause all the methods have these horrible side effects or they're super expensive or they're incredibly painful or, you know, and I just think it's interesting to me, like looking at the fertility landscape because like, what is going on? Like, I just, what is going on with fertility? Like, I just, I literally at this point don't know anyone who's not using tech, you know, assisted reproductive technology. And I'm talking like 20s, 30s. I'm not talking 40s. Like, everybody. Like, you know, what is going on? And why aren't they? Like, I have a friend who did IVF for like 10 years, had twins then had a natural pregnancy like a year later. And she's just like, why aren't they studying me? Like, why don't they want to know? And I'm like, cause there's no money. They don't want to know like how you got spontaneously pregnant after 10 years of IVF. Cause there's no money. What do you think that's about? Well, goodness. I mean, I think there's so many different things. I mean, I struggled with, fertility. I had a few miscarriages. I was older, got married when I was 34, I think. And like, we didn't start to have kids till later and had had all of that. And through that, I've discovered I had Hashimoto's Mm. and I probably always had it always freezing. Like I'm freezing all the time. So I love California. Um, and running all these additional tests that even I didn't run on myself knowing what I know, you know, and like discovering and deep diving. And I think a lot of it is a lot of my friends were on birth control until they decided they wanted to have kids. And then I was not, but I probably had all of these added stresses. I used to live in New York city, (laughs) right? That in itself is, mm -hmm. but we've all lived there. Um, you know, a lot of, stress on myself trying to like be independent and make money and like then find a relationship then get married like all the things so i think that's like stress environment um not eating right either grew up in the 80s and 90s mm-hmm. so probably th- i was a vegetarian when i was a teenager because i didn't like meat but also probably because i wanted to be skinny so all of these at layers and layers of things that so many of my friends and I, the whole generation basically was kind of brought up like that. Um, so I think that, and then obviously envi- environmental, I mean, look at what everybody's putting on their skin, like what's in our food. I think that there's so many Air, different our drinking water, what's in our, you know? Yeah. yeah. And like just even drinking like alcohol, like I feel like that like really got much bigger 
it probably it's always been around, but I feel like in terms of like my friends in our twenties, early thirties, like my parents didn't drink like that. Like they were married, had kids sooner. Like it was just a very different generation of like what we were putting in our bodies and not thinking about what was going to happen 10 years from now. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Definitely. Cumulative effect. I mean, E all of the above, right? It's, it's all of those environmental factors and everything come together and create this perfect storm where we're seeing the fertility rates just dropping. And even in men, it's dropping, right? It's something like 50% viable uh, sperm versus, you know, decades ago or something. So yeah, it's just dropping all around us and it's, it's, yeah. And so then it makes it even harder so then you're doing those things like IVF and all those extra things, which are now in the U.S. getting regulated and <laughs> and getting weird and scary. And it's so hard to just exist as as a, as a uterus owner, we'll say, in this uh, in this country. It's like damned if you do and damned if you don't. And it's always been like that. But now it's dangerously, you know, you can end up in jail, fined, dead because yeah. of you know, oh, well, you have to sit in the parking lot until you go into sepsis and then we'll do the DNC. Yeah. And if you live, I great, but if DNC. not, <laughs> no, I I DNC. it was the most, it was horrible. And like, I had scarring in my uterus. Like I had to get like special internal, thank God I like, you know, cranial sacral and lots of fascia work, but mm-hmm. nobody wants to go through that. No, especially no. without support. Like, no. yeah. and I, I also see, I mean, I'm just going to like go out on a limb here and there's, n- I'm not, I have nothing to back up what I'm saying except for my own observations. But, you know, Ricky and I, like, you know, my kids are 14 and 17, her kids are in her twenties. And so, you know, we've kind of seen like this next generation grow up. And I do think that, you know, such a large percentage of these kids are, not wanting to be, you know, assigned gender. And I really do feel, you know, that this has a lot to do with like what we're all talking about, like how difficult it is to be a uterus owner and categorized as a woman, or even how difficult it is to be like a man, you know, like what a man is supposed to be like, I I think in a way it's like I see this generation where they're like looking for a more fluid, like a newer way forward that kind of like avoids these, you know, polarities. And and I I I really feel kind of like I don't know the whole landscape to us. Like when we were researching this new birth documentary, right? It's like well, you can't now, like when we made the business being born 15 years ago, you could kind of still like just talk about having a baby, right? Like, how do you have a baby? Now you can't really talk about having a baby without talking about how you get pregnant, right? Miscarriage, which is miscarriage is like a major part of the landscape, which it always has been, but was never public, right? So you have to talk about like just that journey of getting to an actual like birth. And then now we have like this whole postpartum, right? With mental health and paid leave. And like, how do you actually like work and have a child? Like talk about making a difference for uterus owners. I mean, it's like, I, I find it shocking and I think it just, that's, I think for COVID, you know, like you, Katie, having your babies and all the horrors that people went through having their babies. And then the horrors of like people like me that had school age children. And like, you really just saw that, oh no, they're, they're just cut the cord on you, lady. Like, good luck. Good luck feeding yourself. Good luck feeding your kids. Like we've got nothing for you. We've got no loans, no support. Here's $1,200 for the year. Um, good luck, good luck schooling your kids. And like, it was just like, mothers were just like decimated, you know? So I just, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know, you see these little pockets of these movements like here and there, but ultimately you know, I'm not going to go out there and say feminism failed. I don't, I don't, 
think that, you know, first wave or second wave, I would never say that is like a failure. I think feminism brought us like huge gains, but I do see why like younger generations do not think (laughs) that feminism was a win and don't want to identify as, you know, feminist because it's like, it's an old mindset. It's like an old paradigm at this point. You know what I mean? And how do you, like, if you look what happened to all of us moms during the pandemic, like, how do you, what, what's the win in that? Like how, I don't understand where is the support? Where's the, I don't, you know, so it's, it's, I don't know, all of this to us, like for Ricky and I, it's just like, we, I think are so intrigued by like, just like not only watching these trends, right, but just also seeing how this kind of biological state of womanhood, you know, intersects with the political, the emotional, the spiritual, like now that like we're both in perimenopause, you know, Ricky and I, and it's like interesting because she and I are not having the experience that a lot of our peers have been having at all, you know, and I don't know why we're not, but like, we all, I don't, I don't know how to help my friends who are struggling, you know, cause now it's like, we see this same vacuum of information. And the only thing that seems to be cropping up is like celebrities coming forward with more products. Yeah. Naomi Watts came out with something and you they're know. all, yeah. Then now there's like this other company that everybody's invested in. But what are these companies? They're just to distribute hormones or distribute like panty liners. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't understand like where's the, you know, like when I have a question, <laughs> she goes, but he's like, you have Dr. Bryden on speed dial. I'm like, I do. That's a good thing about making a movie. Like when I have a question, I like email Dr. Lara Bryden in New Zealand. And I'm like, Lara this is what's happening to me. And she's like, okay, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, you have my book. I'm like, I know I have your book, but I need, you know, but like, I don't know, honestly, like, I don't know how you figure these things out. Otherwise. <laughs> that was the, the root cause. You didn't sell the movie, but you do have like the expert on speed dial <laughs> at your disposal. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. Like, like Abby and I, she's how old are you? 54. I'm 55. <laughs> she's a year younger than me. And I still get a regular period. I have my period right now. I did 29. I have never had a hot flash. I have never, like, I just went to my doctor who I love. She's like up there with Laura Bryden, Dr. Jennifer Lang. And like, I talked to her about what you, Abby, you told me what you're, what you're doing now. She oh, yeah. doesn't, she doesn't want me to, or she was, you know, because everything's working. Like there's no, I have not had knock wood. Okay, I have not had any, what, nothing. Like, yeah. Yeah, nothing. I, I mean, my period period's a little heavier this month. You know, she said that's maybe because the the lining is a little thicker, maybe. But like, and I cramps. I cramps more than I normally do. Like, I really like. Yeah, me too. This this month in particular, me but too. my body works. Like I'm, and I also feel so lucky. I did not have fertility issues. I got pregnant. I was on the pill. Made that mistake and learned the hard way after the fact of like the side effects with my hair. You know, my hair loss was totally contributed, attributed to being on the pill for so long. But I got pregnant the first time I tried with both of my boys. I never had a miscarriage, thankfully. Um, Yeah, my body works. Like I and I feel like I dodged. I don't know. Being born, like I, I feel so glad that I'm older now. I'm not dealing. My husband had a vasectomy. Like those days are over. It's just yeah. for me but it's such a scary scary time to be a woman to be a kid to be it's just all really hard there's not a lot of money in the root cause right like it's easier to sell a product than it is to go well we need to talk about food lifestyle stress management that's that's not as much money and it's not an easy take this pill answer. So we're, you know, especially in this country, we're not huge fans of anything that takes more than just popping a pill <laughs> as an answer for things. Oh my God. No, I know now they have a new pill for postpartum depression. I'm not surprised. Kind of wonder what is that? Is it just really some old antidepressant that they like rebranded or something? What is that? Probably, probably. Or like how about you give people paid time off and yeah. 
they do. deliver food to their house and <laughs> right. the night like the government sub- subsidized a night nurse, you know, like a lactation yeah. consultant, like all the things you need. Right? No, it's just, we'll just give you a pill. Here's another pill so that you know pharmaceutical companies can make even more money off your back while you go back to work in three weeks after you've had your kid. And they talk about Ozempic and all those fucked up. It's not a fucked up drug. Let me take that back. It is a drug that's you know necessary for people with diabetes, but to how it's being abused, and we do not understand the long term effects of what is going to happen with all these people that are now dependent. I mean, it's very similar to like the pill to me. It's like we're telling society that we need this drug to maintain our. It's just yeah, yeah. It's. Mm-hmm. I want to flip the script a little bit. We've gotten some good rants, and I'm stoked about it. But I want to hear what you love about doing this work. Like, I want to hear the glory stories. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? Everything. Everything. It's. It's. It is. I I consider it my life's work. This this particularly the the birth work. I mean, the, the you know, this the other films. They certainly are super meaningful to me. But they didn't come from like my heart and my soul of like I need to do this and to see just the lasting impact that it has had. Like I, I you know, we all want to like leave our mark. I mean, I know for mm-hmm. me, like I really. I wanted to do something in this lifetime that was actually making a difference. And I know like how much that film has changed people. I mean, we have it happen all the time. Women come up to me and just break down of just, just how that movie prompted them to go into birth work or prompt, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's so meaningful to so many um, it's everything to me. And I, I, you know, now I'm in this phase of my life where I feel, you know, I, I did the show and I, I made a lot of money and I, you know, people know my name or whatever, but it's like that, that work is like the work I want when I die. I want that at the top of my, you know, this, this is what I did for, for women. We did, Abby and I did. Um, so yeah, I, I, I live for this work and I, and I, I, I'm so proud of, of it. And I'm so grateful that, people were interested in this, this material, you know? Yeah, I agree. No, it's really, really, I mean, I think the reality of like the situation on the ground that we're ranting about is like, right. That's like the piece that we can't change. And that's what we always said. Like, you know, with, with both of these movies, with all of our movies, it's really like Ricky said, it's about the one person. Like, that's what it's about. It's about the one person who watches the business of birth control and is like, oh my God, like, that's what was going on with me in my twenties and no one would believe me. And now I feel validated because you've showed me that like, this is a real thing, you know, or the person who like, I met this young woman last night, you know, at the event, and she was just like talking about the business being born, about how it just was sort of like, you know, activated this deep inner knowledge, you know, of of people knowing like, but this is how it should be, you know, but it's not that way, but this is how it should be. And I think that's, you know, it's just like, even just sort of dancing and playing in that sort of like, this could be the reality. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is, you know, what it it could be like. And it's not always like that. And, you, you know, you saw in the business of being born, like, we're very even-handed about that, you know, with that, you know, Ricky had this, like, incredible experience of pulling her baby out of herself in her bathtub, you know, and I had, like, the train wreck, like, you know, super quick early labor running to the hospital for a C-section you know, like that, like totally opposite. But the, the bottom line is you can't control, right. But it's like, you know, you're informed and I think, you know, what's happening and like, and that I think is, is, is all we can like kind of ask for. Right. And it's just like, you, you, you know, even like when I was in that hospital, like having my V back, after my, you know, first was an emergency C-section, like when I was having my V-back, like there was like a time where the V-back was like not going well at all. And they came in and my doctor wasn't there yet. And they were like, you know what, can you just sign these forms? Because I just, I think we're probably going to have to go to the OR, like the de- the tracing isn't looking good. And I was just like absolute 
surrender at that moment, there was nothing in me that was like, you're trying to pull one over on me. Cause it's like, no, no, no. I knew it wasn't going so great. I could see the tracings and I was just like absolute surrender. Like, I don't know if this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to happen. I have another C-section big deal. But the point is like, I didn't feel coerced. I didn't feel tricked. I didn't feel duped. I didn't feel pressured. Like I understood what was happening and I was, you know, and that's really, I think the, the piece of it for us, it's like, we're not going to change the system. Right. But we can sort of plant these seeds. And like Ricky said, people see the film and they become a doula or they go into public health or they go into menstrual research or, you know, they, they kind of see themselves or their experience in the film. And that's, that's really always what we're, what we're going for. And I think that piece of the work is like, it's so rewarding that it's almost like you almost can't feel it anymore, right? It's almost like hard to take it in, I guess, is what I'm saying. Because it's like so, like people will come up to us all over the world. Like we'll be sitting at like a cafe in Mexico and like the waitress will come over and like kneel down and start crying. And we're like, oh, we know what this is. <laughs> you know, like you saw the movie. <laughs> so beautiful. I love that. People can just be like open and sharing. Oh my God. What would you, what kind of advice would you give to anyone that wants to follow in your footsteps and kind of pursue women's health and documentaries and, and going down kind of that path of resistance in a way? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Pockets or someone does. Cause it's really hard. I mean, it's just that these documentary films take forever and there you 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 don't you don't even break even you just don't it can't be about money it has to i i mean i really do believe it has to be about a calling um and they're so meaningful i mean documentary film is like my favorite genre i i just watched the navalny documentary oh i saw that at sundance last year i've been obsessed with it since then oh now like posthumously it is it's like they did that it was like it was for this reason it was literally for when yeah. he was killed and yeah. it's, it's anyway, but, but I, what advice do I have? I don't know. I just, I, I love being a storyteller and I love, I'm just, I've always, been, you know, what, I think what made me a good talk show host is I was always so curious about people and relationships and why we do the things we do. Like I'm still super curious about all, you know, aspects of relationship and um, just like, I don't know. Just like if you have a calling to do something, don't let anything get in your way of doing it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's really, you know, if the realities and the financials of documentary, they are really difficult right now. The landscape's really super difficult. But, you know, there's so many different modalities now you know, make a podcast, make TikToks, make Snapchat videos, you know, write a blog. Like there's so many different ways that you can get these stories out there and probably platforms that are still going to like emerge. Right. Um, yeah. So that's what I would say. It's like, you know, just, and, and there's never going to be like, too many voices in this area <laughs> because we don't have very many, you know? So we really like, we need the voices. And I think you can see how things change. Like, even if you look at in the last 15 years, since we made the movie, like what's happened, let's say with black maternal health, you know, there have been so many incredible advocates, some of whom are unfortunately victims of the system but there have been so many advocates and activists like really really you know putting this out there not only making documentaries but telling stories l looking at the statistics and now it's kind of like you know that like saving black mothers and black maternal health i mean now it's like a thing it's a thing and it's like getting tons of coverage press coverage you know, even hospital systems are trying to, you know, I mean, you know, Cedars-Sinai has a massive lawsuit 
um, about a black mother who died, who we we know, you know, Charles Johnson's wife, Kira. And I think that that's, you know, like, that's the first step. That's the first step, you know? So it's like, tell these stories, get it like out there, expose these things. And then, you know, movements usually take like 10 to 15 years, right? To really see any change. But we were saying today, we were just my, uh, one of the doctors in Business of Being Born sent us an article today about the rise in out of hospital birth and the rise in midwife assisted out of hospital birth for high risk patients. Way more people having twins at home, having VBEX at home, things like that. And in the article, it said like the home birth, even though it's still very, you know, less than 2%, since 2016, the home birth rate has gone up 56%. So it's a big jump, even though it's still a tiny, tiny segment, right? But so that's like, since 2016, okay, well, business of being born came out in 2008, right? So you see, it took, took 10 years, right, for, and for that to kind of move. And maybe the pandemic, I'm sure, pushed a lot of people outside the hospital too. But so like, things do change and the pendulum does swing. But I would say like, if you just, you know, tell these stories, however you're able to, and like shine a light on, on these truths or your experiences, um, it all has an impact. It all like piece by piece. I think it all has, adds up. That is super inspiring. And I love it. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, all right. So I have one more question before we go to the speed round. <laughs> and then we let you go and be free. <laughs> okay. I have someone here that's waiting on me. Okay. 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 All right. Very quickly, tell us what's your non-negotiables for self-care. Okay. Let me think. Mine is baths. Oh, that was easy. Um, okay. Mine is, I have a, I have a list. I have a list. <laughs> You're good with the self-care. Sleep. I wear my aura ring. I mean, sleep is super important to me. And, um, exercise I'm, like I'm, I've been on a health kick the last four months so I basically I've lost 25 more than 25 pounds without any big pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals help um which I which is really I'm super proud of myself because it was dangled by a doctor toward you know like my doc not my new doctor but my old doctor was pushing it very hard for both my husband and me and this was over a year ago and I was so like, I, you know, I made the business of birth control. I'm not going to do that. Like I, I, and, and so anyway, exercise. So I hike every day pretty much except when the monsoon came in in Malibu, but I do my two to three mile hike every day. I get a, a lot of sleep and, uh, and I get high every night with my husband. Cannabis is a big, big, big part of my, uh, my mental health, my, my joy, and uh, yeah, I yeah I have a Ricky Lake and Bake is my is my cannabis company, and it's it's happening, Abby. There's something happening with it. I'm uh, yeah. There's call me because uh, yeah, endometriosis cannabis is my go to, and uh, I'm well, I'm in on the Ricky Lake and Bake. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, those are my there's there's more things that are non negotiables for me, but that's those are the ones that come to mind right now. I love it. Okay, speed round, go with your gut. Just first thing that comes to your mind, what's your biggest craving? Mine is in the morning, my daily dose mushroom coffee. Mm. Yeah, I finally at 55 years of age, I discovered my uh, Starbucks drink. Like I'm one of those people I get in line at Starbucks and I'm, I'm like, I don't know what to get. I don't know what to get. I get that new cold, the nitro iced coffee with heavy whipping cream, a splash of heavy whipping cream. Cause I've been doing keto for four months. And so I haven't had, I had to get rid of the, the, we call it crack, uh, the coffee mate, the shit with all the sugar in it. Like I haven't had sugar or bread in over four months now. So my, that Starbucks nitro iced cold brew with the splash of heavy cream. That's what I'm craving. So if when you're both craving something, it's it's coffee first. Is there any oh, other? Yeah, because I eat? haven't had sugar. I've just I've been <laughs> off bread and sugar. Normally, be bread like a like a lo, a baguette, 
like a real good warm baguette would be my yeah or pizza but i haven't had any of that so yeah coffee we'll have to go with coffee also what's your favorite way to move hiking oh or sex but but hiking <laughs> you can do both <laughs> that's good i would say dancing and sex I love it. Okay. So when you're super stressed out, what is your go-to self-care move? I mean, sometimes I, if I'm stressed out, I don't want to get stoned because then it, it amplifies that feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't meditate really. I mean, really being out in nature, I'd say. Being, going to walk with my dog. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My dog. Um, yeah, I would definitely say, um, like, breath work, sound baths, um, just putting on, like, a certain soundtrack that I have and journaling. What music do you listen to when you're working? I mean, right now, I am the biggest Swifty ever. So Taylor Swift is on, like, constantly. And I haven't seen her at the live tour yet. We're trying. Abby's supposed to hook us up with some tickets in Europe. We don't know where. We're supposed to go and meet there. I'm obsessed with her. So I would have to say her. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think mine when I'm working, it's more of kind of like these, um, they're like, they're like mixes. There might be, they might be a little bit more like, um, I don't know. They're like mixes that kind of like friends send me from Europe and kind of techno-y but sort of like chill vibe abesis sort of sonica style can't be i can't hear like a lot of lyrics or a lot of like you know it has to be a little more like background for sure all right favorite country or place you visited hmm. oh ibiza and burning man those are my two favorite places outside of where i live now i would take those and i would probably add some Hawaii. Favorite holiday? Um, I love my birthday. And <laughs> my birthday, my birthday. <laughs> Just make that a holiday. <laughs> um, What is my favorite holiday? Oh, it's a good one. I don't know. Maybe Thanksgiving. Food you hate. Well, I know um, hers. I know hers. Olives. Olives. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate duck and I hate peppers. Mm. Pumpkin spice, yay or nay? Nay. Hands down. <laughs> Do you cook? No. <laughs> I have to cook because I have children. Yeah. I'm forced into cooking. Favorite place to work? I mean, I would say anywhere Abby is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. On Zoom with this I, one. I like working at home. I love it. And very last one, what's your ideal Friday night? Oh, duh. It's <laughs> Friday night right now, watching Bill Maher and getting high with my man, and that's what's that's what's on the docket tonight. <laughs> He's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you oh my meet god. Him? Did you meet him, Sasha, at, at the premiere? Mm -hmm. Okay. Katie, were you at the premiere? I don't remember. I was. I don't think I met him though. <laughs> yes 
Mine would be definitely with my love. We don't really get high together, though. We don't watch Bill Maher, but I would say doing anything with him, like going to hear music or going to have some nice wine or going to see a show or comedy or, yeah. Oh, love it. Love it. Thank you so much for joining us today for ranting and and raging and, you know, all that good stuff. We need it done. Thank you. Super appreciate your time today. Love you. And uh, the besties, period besties podcast, two sets of besties. Like I couldn't ask for more. Friday, you know what I'm doing tonight? Well, same. I have the joint ready for after (laughs) this. Like I rolled it this morning and I was like, this is my post podcast (laughs) recording joint. (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for time. And thank you again for your support. It's been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Love you, ladies. Bye. Bye. A big shout out and thank you to our sponsors for today's episode, Period Coaching School and Katie Bresek Wellness. Thanks to you, our favorite bestie, for listening to the Period Besties podcast, where no topic is TMI. And of course, share this episode with your besties. Remember to leave us a five-star review, nothing less than the best for us besties, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Stasha Washburn and at Katie Brussack, or email us at periodbestiespodcast at gmail.com. Check out more about us at katiebressack.com and periodcoachingschool.com. And of course, check the show notes for free goodies and extras that support this episode. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now, besties.